Welcome into the Cam and Strick Podcast, episode number seven. What up, Cam Jansen? What up, what up, what up, what up? How you doing, man? I'm chilling, baby. What's hey. catching your attention nowadays? You watching a lot of hockey or Yeah, no? I watch hockey every single day. Andy Strickland, you know that. Of course, we're at the normal brand, of course. And uh, so nice to have uh, Jeff O'Neill on. He, of course, he works for uh, uh, up in Toronto and, uh, and TSN Sportsnet. Yeah. And he had a lot to say. We asked him a lot of questions. He's been in the league a long time, so... Uh, Check this one out, and Jeff O'Neill. And he works in television, too, and, and he had right. a great career, man. 40-goal scorer and scored a lot of goals, could really shoot the puck. Oh, he was good. And now he's doing his thing on television for He can shoot like you, Andy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Jeff O'Neill coming your way. <laughs> Another great guest here once again today. We're live at the Normal Brand here in Ladue. You can't miss it. We'll tell you all about that and all the great deals they have coming up. As well as we get prepared for the Christmas season, it's a little bit of snowy weather outside. People get a little worked up. They don't know how to drive in the snow. Jeff knows how to drive in the snow. Well, Cam is one of those. Cam has like this huge truck. He can't drive in the snow. Um, listen, you know, you always know that we want the uh, the best guest, right? Absolutely. So we delivered the best guest here on the show on the Cam and Strick podcast, and we have another good one for you here on this week and. The one and only O Dog Jeff. The O Dog, love it. <laughs> Jeff, what's going on, buddy? How you guys doing? I'm a little bit disappointed today. I bought this like, it's like a Jeep pickup truck, and I thought it was going to be because I take my kids skiing every weekend. I thought it was going to be like this awesome truck in the snow. <laughs> I was sliding around the roads like I was like on a go kart today. I have to call the people and be like, "How do I? What mode do I put this thing in?" Because it was, <laughs> it was a joke. I we we got snow up here too, guys, and it's. I just love how people, they just, I get it, it's snowing, but just go a little bit slower and drive normally and things should be normal, but it, it gets crazy, man. You don't have any, but you're Canadian. Like that, that That's supposed to happen here Thank or maybe you. in Raleigh, North Carolina. You'd fit in in St. Louis with that kind of driving <laughs> style there, Jeff. Isn't it, dude, you have to see when you're in Carolina, if there's one drop of a snowflake, every school is shut down for 10 days. I'd never seen anything like it. They're soft out there, I heard. They're soft in Carolina. They're soft in St. Louis as well. <laughs> but it's, it's crazy, but we're all alive, so we made it. No, exactly. And it's funny, I, when I played in Ontario, uh, in, you know, in the OHL, same as you, I played for Guelph as well. I remember seeing like like 16-year-old girls driving 80 miles an hour in a foot of snow without any problems. But you come to St. Louis... And no one can do shit, even in a dump truck. It's it's, it's yeah. nuts. So you guys know how to deal with it. We absolutely don't. But Cam, uh, the one thing I find crazy is when there's a snowstorm, and I have a truck, and I'm not, like I'm a 43 year old guy, and I got three kids, and and I don't drive like a like a really old person, but <laughs> I'll always see a guy like in a neon, like a little neon, going 180 miles an hour <laughs> on the highway in a fucking snowstorm, and I'm just like. How are they doing that? Like, what What kind of car? Like, how do they do that? But I don't know. That's just, that's just one of the things I see. It was a tricked out neon. <laughs> they're they're really cool. What the hell it is, man. <laughs> With snow tires. Yeah. You sound like me, 43 years old and three kids. I feel your pain, Jeff. I know exactly what you're going through. We kind of relate from that standpoint. Hey, I'm curious. Uh, you've been around hockey forever. Who are your St. Louis connections? Who are you tight with? Who played here? Who maybe lives here? Besides Kelly, you can't say Kelly Chase. Uh, no, I we know. don't care I'll, about uh, we don't care about him. <laughs> Who else? I'll go. I'll go a little bit different with my St. Louis connections. Uh, uh, Brendan Shanahan was my first left winger uh, in Hartford. I played in Hartford, and Shanny was my first left winger. And it was like there was a bunch of St. Louis guys that came over there. Um, Jeff Brown, Nelson Emerson, oh, yeah. and. Um, you know, they were not exactly. I kind of felt bad because I was a young kid in Hartford, and I kind of thought the Hartford Whalers. It was the team that drafted me. And I thought it was the greatest place ever because uh, they were in the NHL. But the guys that came from different organizations, they were like, um, "This isn't. This isn't. <laughs> this is not uh, how it works in the NHL." And it was tough because we didn't draw a lot of fans, and everyone in the in the New England market was either Ranger fans or Bruins fans. So it was like. You know, the Whalers were the odd guys out, and we ultimately had to move. But um, it, it was just, you know, the guys from St. Louis, and they had a good crew there. They had, obviously, Holly and Chaser, and, um, you know, they had, they had a good thing going there. And when they got to Hartford, I don't think they necessarily loved it, and I don't think any of them kind of lasted too long there, that couple of years maybe. But um, there, was a, there was a deep St. Louis connection when I got to Hartford. I'll tell you what, even playing in the American League when I played for Albany, 
when we played Hartford, I'm like, oh, this place is kind of dumpy. And that was an American League standard, so I, I, I feel your pain on that. But then you... <laughs> But then you go to Carolina, which is like a unique situation, though, because anytime you fly to Carolina, I remember playing them, and people are playing fucking, they're playing football in the parking lot. It's just beautiful trees everywhere. It's like it's like a big park everywhere you look. But how was that transitioning from from Hartford to Carolina? And all of a sudden, you guys had a pretty damn good team too. Yeah, I loved it, Cam. I mean, we and it's it's a, it, it, it's what you want. I mean, people like I also played for the Toronto Maple Leafs, where it's like. You, you're known everywhere you go, and if you score two goals on Saturday night, and you go you're out going to a out. restaurant, mm. you're yeah, you're 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 loving life. But um, in Carolina, I don't think I got recognized the first five years I was there, which I was totally fine with because that's not something that I really care about. I love golf. I got to play golf every day, um, and I I hung out with my golf buddies. I'd go and play golf after practice, and I'd hang out back in the card room with the old guys back there, and that was kind of the uh, the life I kind of carved out for myself, and I thought that was awesome. I think it's great not hanging out with your teammates 24-7 too. I kind of had my life away from the rink. The weather was awesome. Pinehurst was 45 minutes away. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I thought that was a great way to kind of live your life. So help me understand a little bit, you know, your perspective as a hockey player because I, I always get two different types of players. I mean, some guys love the game. That's all they want to do. They're David Perron. They go home with yeah. stick handle and they're living a little nerdy, a little nerdy. And and other guys never watch hockey and are playing in the NHL solely because they're good at it and you know it, it pays well. Yeah. Which, which side of the fence were you on, Jed? Did you love the game? Did you eat, breathe, and sleep hockey when you were playing in the NHL? Yeah, I kind of. My approach was, I was always shocked when I I was basically kind of a, a quiet hockey nerd. I wanted to watch all the time because I thought you could pick up a little bit. You could pick up something, and I kind of use that in my job now as an analyst. It's just like if you continue to watch, you might see one play where a defenseman turns a certain way, and you might be able to take advantage of that. Or like a a Tarasenko move, he has this kind of juke and jive move that he's done a couple times where he looks like he's going backwards, and then he goes back forwards. And I've seen that like three or four times. And if you watch enough games, you're going to realize that's not the first time he's done that. Um, So... It's just I I think you got to watch, and I was shocked when I, I played hockey with a bunch of guys that were like, I have no idea who's on this team. I'm like, well, how do you prepare? Like, do you not know that Scott Stevens can knock you out if you oh. cross the middle? Mm-hmm. Or, oh. you know, this guy, if you're a fighter, like, I don't know. I just – but that's the way it goes. Some guys don't care to watch, and that's their prerogative. And um, I, But I think you benefit from just paying attention to see what's going on. Yeah, and I think a lot of the younger guys do, especially the American kids now. Jeff, because, you know, you have the NHL network that's on here. So, you know, they're watching a lot of hockey now that we didn't have the opportunity to watch. You know, when we were kids, maybe a game would show up on Sports Channel that, yeah, didn't, that didn't involve the Blues. We, we I mean, didn't know anything. Wait, wait, wait. We didn't know any, Andy, we didn't know anything about you know, kid, any other game. Uh, kid, kids teams. got to watch Cam on Versus, you know, back in the day. Also. And then watch <laughs> Duck Hunting afterwards, Jeff. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, it really has changed. So I, I, I like to hear that because um, even some of the guys that come into the Blues organization now, like a Sammy Blay, for example, he watches hockey every single night, and he lives with Vince good, Dunn, should. and Dunn makes fun of him for watching hockey, you know, so... I don't know. Yeah, but that's good. That's just doing your work. It's almost like doing – the way I look at it, it's like guys are guys. And, you know, when people bug me about complaining about watching sports every night, it's like I would be doing that anyway. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's that's just – we get paid to watch something and that we would be watching anyway. So why not watch it? You might pick up something that might help you out. It's weird though, Jeff. I I, I didn't though. When I played in – and, you know, I'm from Eureka, Missouri – yeah. And we didn't have, we, you know, the Blues were the only damn thing on, on TV as far as right. hockey's concerned. So I didn't even know what the fuck hockey was, but I'm like, I love the Blues. And so I didn't, it, it, even when I was playing, I was just like kind of worried about my own thing. And then once I'm out and all of a sudden you do radio and especially what you're doing, like, I feel like I can't even watch movies because I need to know what I the know. fuck is going on every second of the day so I don't like a, look like a jackass when people are well, asking me questions. Thing. It's like when I took this job, uh, Ray Ferraro, I sat down with him and I'm like, what's the key? doing the job and he said you basically have to know the minnesota wild like you know the toronto maple leafs Mm -hmm. exactly and it's like so you gotta you know you watch some eastern games and then you watch some central games and then when they end you go into the western conference games because i don't know you go on tv you gotta know your stuff and you gotta know what's going on and you gotta know 
what players do what because if you don't you get asked a question you might look like an idiot hey was it your dream as a kid to play for the maple leafs like every toronto kid and oh, for, and was sure. it was no it question. was it what you expected it or was it a little bit of a letdown no i it was everything i expected i actually the first time i put on the jersey i i, I remember very clearly i was sitting beside steve thomas it was in hamilton cops coliseum for an exhibition game and i'm like Damn, this is pretty cool. And I remember tearing up. It was a difficult situation for me, guys, because I got traded to Toronto. Uh, my brother was killed in a car accident, and I basically told Jim Rutherford that I wanted to come back home to be around family. So mm. it was just all the emotions involved with that. It was kind of a, a, a sad but happy day, and I don't know. Uh, it was, But to me, it was a dream come true, and nothing could ever top that experience being a Toronto Maple Leaf it's a team I watched every Saturday night as a kid I used to play in the NHL and come home for the Toronto Maple Leafs if we got didn't make the playoffs or got beat out of the playoffs I would come home and if I was at the game as an NHL player cheer for the Leafs which is kind of weird and kind of wow. goofy but that's that's kind of the way it happened we've seen some guys come back and do that especially with all these young NHL players that are from St. Louis. I mean, I saw a bunch of these guys during the playoffs last year, especially deep in the playoffs and close to the Stanley Cup final. You know, you mentioned your brother. He he was a player too, right? I, I think there was a Chris Pronger connection maybe in yeah. Peterborough, right? Remind me of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, my brother is um, – I remember him calling me saying, we got this young guy coming to Peterborough uh, who said he was – I think Prong's committed to college and he said he wasn't going to the OHL and – I don't know what round Peterborough took him, but um, he just said, "Wait till you will come and watch this guy. He's the weirdest looking player you ever seen. He's like <laughs> six foot six. He's really skinny. He's got small feet." Uh, but I'll tell you <laughs> what, my feet. my dad used to take me and my brother up to Peterborough every Thursday night, and we would go watch this Chris Pronger character. And it only takes you like one or two games, or back in the day, to realize how unbelievable that guy was. How it was like it, it kind of looked awkward when he was that young, but then ultimately to see how he controlled the whole game, like a Nick Lidstrom, how a guy could just, you know, that's what they did. They controlled the whole game. It just, you know, he had the puck. He would look for forwards. He would. It was just an unbelievable thing to see at a young age because he was, he was so different looking than everybody else, but so good at the same time. I have such an appreciation for what Prongs was back then and what he ultimately became as an NHL player. Well, he took a beating here, Jeff, dude. Early on, when he, he, came, took, from, when he, he came from Harford, he took of all places, a fucking yeah. beating yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. You got because Shanny everyone leave. was like, this guy's not Brendan Shanahan, exactly. and he's not mean. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, it didn't take him long. No. And he, it, didn't did, take, no. it didn't take him long to say, you know what, I'm going to start cross-checking people across the head. There and you go. People in St. Louis will like it, <laughs> because he did that... Uh, uh, quite nicely uh, in the NHL. Well, I'll just say that. I'll give Mike Keenan credit because he did say when he made the deal, he said, hey, this guy will win a Norris Trophy one day. And again, like Cam, he grew up here in St. Louis. I did too. Cam said he was a fan of the Blues. Not They, they don't know who guys are who don't play for the Blues. And Even though they, hockey. They're not like following the, the OHL, so they don't know who the, what the potential is. But, you know, Brendan Shanahan, just an absolute superstar on and off the ice here, so that was tough for them to take. Um, all right, Jeff. So you said you got to you got to know the Minnesota Wild just as well as you know the Toronto Maple Leafs. I mean, who's your favorite team to watch right now? When they're on, you're glued to it and you're watching. Uh, that's a great question. I think the Boston Bruins, for some reason, it's not like this like new and up and coming team, but they just they play so good. And um, if I look at it right now and I watch the Boston Bruins, the Washington Capitals, uh, and if I go to the West, the Vegas Golden Knights and the Nashville Predators, I kind of think that you might be looking at the Final Four right there because they are just they just seem to be that much better than everybody else. And then mm -hmm. you took a look at the Blues, too. I think they just ripped off seven in a row. Yeah. So they're saying, you know what, last year was not a fluke. We got a recipe here. So maybe those four or five teams, you got to think. And I, by the way, I'm not just throwing them in there because you guys are from St. Louis. Yeah, you but are. But you have to recognize the team. <laughs> <laughs> you have to recognize the team that just won seven in a row. So... Um, and I don't know if you guys noticed this, but it just seems like there's a lot of like mediocrity or badness in the league this year. It seems like teams are really stinking the joint out and losing losing a bunch, and they can't keep it out of their net. I don't know if that's me, but it just seems like a lot of negativity. Yeah, you know, I said that last year, too, because, you know, last year was not the best team the Blues have ever put out there. I mean, they've had great teams and obviously been around for a long time, but they've won divisions. They've had times when they've gone to you know deep in the playoffs, but they could never 
get it done. They were never better than the other teams that were really good too, whether it was Chicago or L.A. or you go back to the De- Detroit days. I felt like last year going into the playoffs, that team didn't exist. Like there was, I mean, you know, I didn't know if the Blues right. were going to win it or not, but I was saying, hey, there's nobody out there that's just the king of the jungle, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I think they got the, just the perfect recipe and you, you know, and you look at the way they play now, they're almost like they just look at each other and say, okay, we got the recipe, guys. You know, I love how aggressive their defensemen are. I love their forwards. They're, whether they're skilled or not skilled, they hit, they finish checks, and their goaltender is obviously an X factor. So, um, you know, they, they got the right recipe right now. You So you, you break down the game every single day. Everybody's listening to you. You got a big audience out there in, in Toronto. You played bef- you played pre lockout in in '04. You played pre lockout, uh, of course, in 2012. But in 2004, major changes came to the NHL. It's right when I came into the league, and no hooking and clutching. Do you like the game now compared to what it was before 2004? Um, what are your big takeaways from from where the NHL is at to where it was? I like the game now, but I think there's too many ticky tack penalties that are just you know, and I think the goaltenders suffer a little bit because you can't touch the hands. But um, I'm not going to lie; I don't miss a, the odd fight here or there where you know your guys settle the score. But uh, if there's no fighting, that's fine. But I just think there's sometimes it's you're just watching a, a special teams practice. It's three hours of uh, this team's on the power play, that team's on the power play, and it's like um, it's just too that, much. That, that, yeah, it's just too much. What do you make out of the Maple Leafs right now? And what's the temperature with uh, with Mike Babcock? And which side are you on in terms of his ability to take the organization and his current team, more importantly, to the highest level? Can he do that? Is he the guy for this team? Yeah, he makes a lot of money. He's the highest paid coach in the league, and I think that he's going to be judged in the playoffs. If this team doesn't get out of the first round, then there might be a problem. But until then... And that's that's all people in Toronto are waiting for. They just they want to wait for the playoffs. But I'll tell you what, it's such a tight league. You got to get your shit together because if you if you take a take a month off, you might not be in the playoffs. So they got to get it together, and hopefully they can get by that first round. They're dealing with injuries right now. They got backup goalie issues, and and we'll see if they can get it together. Is playing in Toronto difficult, Jeff? Especially for these young guys now and the media coverage. I mean, break that down for me. I don't think it's that difficult. I mean, if you want to go on Twitter and Instagram every day and read everything, then that's your prerogative. But, you know, you got to deal a couple of minutes every day after practice and talk to the media. I don't think that's that that difficult of a thing to do. So um, that's what's there in Toronto, and that's what's um, that's what you got to do. If you don't like it, then you got to go play somewhere else. But that's the, you know, that's the responsibilities of being a Maple Leaf. And it's not like every player. They don't want to talk to every single player in there. It's – Two or three, and if you don't like it, uh, you got to go make some a lot of money somewhere else. But that's the responsibilities. Did I read that uh, you have a fear of flying? Because if you do, I did, but I got you got I over it. We got married. Yeah, my fiance told me she's like, if you don't want to travel anywhere and your <laughs> that, vision wait, of that, going on vacation is two hours away in a car, then that's probably not going to work. So, oh I, my god, I figured it out. So I see, I, but how I, do you figure that? out? How do you though? figure that? I, I think I got fucking vertigo or something. So I, I like I need to like talk to somebody like you, <laughs> like to help me with this shit because it drives me nuts. Yeah. You have a fear? No, oh my god, I'm horrible. I do too, a little bit. Yeah. I'm horrible. Yeah, it's just get to the airport early and uh, visit a restaurant. Okay. And they have a good uh, they have a good uh, cure for flying. So that's basically the routine when it happens. Well, in Canada, like I can't you, you don't serve beer till past nine o'clock. So usually I'm in the. Uh, I like. I usually like it early in the morning, like five or six, when I'm when I'm traveling. They don't serve it, so I, I mean, do I drink coffee? It makes me even more nervous when I'm jacked up on coffee. Yeah, the coffee's no good, buddy. You can't do that. It just creates more more nervousness. Let me write that down real quick. Coffee, hey. no good, makes you more nervous. Hey, okay. we're only gonna keep you for a few more minutes, but working for TSN, how much do you enjoy it? Do you guys all get along? You guys like working with one another? What's your favorite part, and maybe your least favorite part about working in television? Um, I love it because we all have different kind of approaches and different views on how the game's played. And that's kind of, uh, you know, Bob McKenzie, Dave Poole and James Dusty, Jamie McLennan, Brian Hayes, everyone I work with, they all see the game differently. And we all respect that we see the game differently. And there's, 
you know, there's no saying, oh, you never played the game or you're wrong on this. It's like people have different opinions and that's what creates content, right? Whether it's radio or television, that's just everybody's got to work together and, you know, that's just why it works. Everyone's got a different opinion and we all try to put together. What about all the insiders? I mean, how do they all kind of interact with one another? Are they, are they keeping information from each other? Are they sharing it? I mean, how do you decide no, who, 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 who gets the FaceTime? Those guys all work together, and they have to because different guys know different agents or mm-hmm. – I don't know. That's a job that's that's tireless. I mean, they they have to be on the phone all day, every day to get information and scoops and be in the right track. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I just get to analyze the games and break down plays. Yeah, I don't fuck with that, by the way. I, I, Andy's our insider. He could do all that bullshit. I, I, I mean, I'm not – I have no time. For, I, have I got no, no time, time for it either. Thank you. I really don't care. Thank you. I, and you know, you know what? The the longer I do this, though, the the less I care either. Like no, I, I want you to care. Andy. I know but, you're the insider. But when I started doing TV with the Blues, that was kind of one of the things. Like you cannot break Blues stories. You cannot, you know, break stories about injuries or contracts or trades. And so I thought that would be. Well, I didn't know how difficult it would be, but I think other people thought that would be really hard and that I'd fall flat on my face right away. But it really it's it's less work. It's not as difficult. It's not as nearly as stressful. Well, you're not working hard enough, Andy. <laughs> Jeff, let me ask you something real quick. It, it, when it comes to this stuff, when it comes to injuries, and, and I know football brings out like they, they, they'll tell you what's going on, but with hockey, like you don't know shit for like three three weeks. Like what is it? Oh, lower body. Well, what the fuck is it? Is a knee? Is it an ankle? Like tell us something. Do you think the NHL should do something and let the media know a little bit more specifics when it comes to injuries? I think Babcock, or not Babcock, Ken Hitchcock said something a couple of years ago. It's like, mm-hmm. look, guys get injured. What the hell is wrong with telling the media what's the injury? I mean, I don't know. It's just that's the way hockey is. It's like, oh, can't tell anybody what the starting goalie is or what the injury is. It's so- <laughs> like, just tell us, will you? The like, starting goalie. Please tell us. Like, <laughs> hey, we, we need to know. Hitch said that when he came to St. Louis. And I remember saying something to John Davidson about that. And JD, oh. J, JD was not going to have it. JD, JD said, no, no we're not unveiling the uh, or releasing the injury information. So um, last thing for you, at least for me, what's what's the one event you haven't called that you want to be involved in just in terms of from an analysis standpoint? I know you played in the World Juniors. Have you been a part of that gold medal, that coverage? Yeah, I've done the World Juniors a bunch of times, and I love doing that event. Uh, I love everything working at TSN, the Hall of Fame game, the mm. trade deadline. It's just you get hyped up for the big events, and they, they always seem to write themselves, so it's been a lot of fun. Jeff, thank you for the time, man. I appreciate it, and uh, you're doing great work. I'm going to be on tomorrow with uh, Carlo and, uh, and and Landsberg, too, so I might uh, pump your tires a little bit. You are going to be a way better interview than Carlo Koyakvo, and he's going to be a little bit pissed at me that I had you on before him, but he could, uh, he could take it and like it. All right, boys. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Okay. See you, buddy. Appreciate it, Jeff. Uh, that was Jeff O'Neill for you. This is the Cam and Strick podcast, of course, coming from uh, coming from uh, the normal brand. The normal brand, great stuff here, Andy. You look slick as Thank usual you. because you're wearing their clothes, and that's it. But this was Jeff <laughs> O'Neill. We got plenty more to come. Check us out on Spotify. Check us out on YouTube. Check us out on iTunes. Cam and Strick podcast. There you have it.